again, I think there has to be a balance. If you're going to church every night of the week and you have no family time, that is not a balance. And God doesn't look favorably on that because somehow, some way, this is a revival. Or Not make fun of people who think they're being abused, you know? Right. I've heard pastors say, oh, you think you're being abused. Welcome to the Grace Escape Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. And welcome back to those that are returning and to all those that are new. I'm Justin. And I am Tiffany. And through Grace, we escaped a high control fundamental Pentecostal church called the United Pentecostal Church that we spent over 30 years in. And we just want to talk from our couch, as we do, um, about all of our experiences and ways that these churches operate and hopefully help someone that is either on their way out or already out. Yeah, we're sharing our journey and some of the things that we've learned along the way. Yes. We, again, are no experts in <laughs> um, biblical theology or even some of the subjects that we um, address. Yeah. But... Um, we try to do a little bit of research and just share. And most of all, it's just to try to get people thinking mm -hmm. um, because I believe the system that we were a part of, um, a lot of the practices of the system we were a part of squelched that. Yes, it did. Shuts your critical thinking off. Yeah. And, and a lot of the times, if you would just write down what some of these leaders and pastors are saying and like read it back, um, without filter and without um, screaming music. and music and all that, a lot of the times it's just crazy nonsense. Weird ramblings. <laughs> and so last week uh, or the last episode, we addressed the differences between the pastor, quote unquote, and biblical authority. And um, I've just felt the need to kind of address spiritual abuse. I think it's a big deal it is. Um, in high control, fundamental groups, um, systems that have cult-like practices. And um, yeah, and uh, today we're going to talk about spiritual abuse mm -hmm. um, and how pastors and church leaders, they can use their position and their power and their or just the system that the church system in itself can yeah. lend itself to that. Um, we won't be talking about um, what can be a very extreme form of that, which is clergy sexual abuse. Um, but that is also rampant in the systems. And um, yeah, it's very, very terrible that um, something that's supposed to be safe, something that's supposed to be yeah. um, a spiritual refuge yes, ends up being... A place of harm and can be very, very hurtful. So I think we should point out at the beginning, not all churches are spiritually abusive. Not all leaders are spiritually abusive. Um, but it is very rampant in these systems, again, in the high control, fundamental systems uh, where you have one main leader making all the decisions. And treating people quite poorly mm -hmm. because they either um, think they can or they're just doing it out of control or they're narcissistic, you know, things like that. Yeah. And in fact, I was reading something about how um, 90, at least 90% of pastors have a form of narcissistic tendencies and a smaller percentage of that have narcissistic personality disorder. Oh boy. Um, and it's really, really sad that that position, and I think the Western culture of that position has really produced that. The system itself has produced that. And so these systems are rife with spiritual abuse. And some pastors can downplay that and they'll even mock spiritual abuse. They, and, they do. And yeah. make fun of it in a way. Yeah. Um, I've seen in churches that we were a part of, um, abuse get uh, abuse in general be downplayed and diminished 
um, women that were being abused, physically. probably physically, mentally, um, all the different cases that abuse can be, be praised and elevated for staying in those abusive relationships as though God had marked them some great honor by being abused and that mm. maybe their partner would be saved if they just continued to say stuck it out and, stuck it out and yeah. stay in that abuse. And as we, as we go through today and list the things that, um, are some tactics that they use or whatever, if you have experienced these or are experiencing these, please know that you do not have to stay in these abusive systems. Yeah. What I was going to say about the point I just made, that was really good. Um, Sorry is, it's disgusting. It's absolutely it is. appalling that a leader would um, not give advice to someone that's in an abusive situation to get out and get safety and get help. And that and that's it's a scary, scary situation to be in, and to be and to have a spiritual leader in your life um, not protect that. I think is just. Um, I just don't have very nice words to say about that. No. And so, yes, if you are in an abusive relationship or in an abusive church system, and some of these things we talk about today ring true, you should get out as quickly as you possible, possibly can. Yeah. So spiritual abuse, the, it's a, it's a real thing for sure. And it, um, first was mentioned really in the sixties, Okay, but more recently it has gained a lot of attention and is a real form of abuse. Like I want to say that out front, mm -hmm. it is a form of abuse. And, um, and sometimes it can be hard to recognize because of some of the tactics that are used like gaslighting, straw man arguments, things of that nature. Um, it can be hard to recognize. Um, and it comes in many forms in the church. Yeah, I wrote down a note actually that I want to say um, it, I think the word can seem, abuse can seem very harsh. And um, so I think we just assume that because we're a part of a God something or a part of a church that this can't that happen, this cannot happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, but we both experienced it in the system oh, that we yes. had that we were a part of. Oh yes. Oh yes. Many, many, many times over and over. And I, I think that uh, of course, perpetrators aren't ever going to admit that they're abusive. Um, so they just continue to perpetuate that <laughs> all is good in the hood. And, uh -huh. and the because there's different degrees of it, some of it just kind of gets swept under the, yeah, the carpet the as, Oh, that's just their personality or that's just how they are. And then the church members are just forced to, to go along with it. And of course, well, and here. you take what we talked about last week, which is a unbiblical view of spiritual authority and you tack that on top of it. And again, it's the system is rife for this to, battle. Yeah. to just continue to boil over. And, um, we're seeing things be sh brought to light, um, all over, as we talked about last mm -hmm. week with some of these more popular leaders. Um, the recent one in the last few months, uh, Mike Bickle of IHOP getting exposed for, um, some things that happened, um, and other ones like Ravi Zacharias a, a year or so ago. Um, it, it eventually comes to light, but sometimes it takes a long, long time. And those are, those are extreme, um, sexual clergy abuse situations, but the spiritual aspect of it that we're going to talk about is sometimes just as damaging to people long-term. And in many cases they can lose their faith and walk away from God altogether. Um, in these situations. Yeah, absolutely. And thank goodness for the exposure. Exposure of any kind of abuse is mm -hmm. so important. And I would just say too, like, um, don't think that you can't report this kind of stuff yeah. too. If it's necessary, like, and if it's applicable, you should be reporting this kind of stuff. Yeah. And in some of these systems, particularly when a leader or a pastor is involved in it, those things are 
kept in the secret sure. out of the light. They don't want to be exposed because of course that sheds a bad light on the church or the system in general. And so, as we mentioned last week, Lois over at spiritualabuse.org has been doing the fight of exposing spiritual abuse, yes. um, for over 20 years, just over 20 years. And so we are by no means again, experts in this. We're just bringing the subject up. I think it's a good time to talk about it. Um, and sometimes even if you've freshly exited a church system that was abusive, you may not even realize all the signs that were there. Um, Or if you are stumbling across this podcast or somebody has sent it to you and you're in a system where some of these things that we're going to talk about today um, are happening and going on, you're hopefully going to see some green lights and red, or red flags more would yeah. be a better way to say it, <laughs> big red flags. Um, and we've talked about some of those before, but today we're going to kind of really focus on some aspects of spiritual abuse yeah. and it won't be thorough. I mean, it will be as thorough as we can get in one episode, but it's not going to be exhaustive by any means. For sure. Um, so you, uh, we have a, um, a definition written down. Uh, and this comes from um, a um, a book called um, shoot I'm gonna forget it now. Uh, we'll link it below uh, and uh, put it on the screen. I, I'm forgetting it right now, but it's it's about untangling spiritual abuse in the church, and yeah. um, this is kind of a summary of from that book, I believe. Yeah, so not a Webster's for sure, but. Um, Uh, spiritual abuse is a form of emotional and psychological abuse. So it's not just, yeah, it's, it's operating in so many other different little, uh, branches, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, that's something to really be aware of. It is characterized by a systematic pattern of coercive and controlling behavior in a religious context. Spiritual abuse can have a deeply damaging impact of course, on those who experience it. And I was just thinking that systematic pattern. Um, I was just going to say that we're not talking about, well, let me just back up and say, if, if one of the things we mentioned today has happened once, if your pastor or your church leader, or even a church member, because I think members can be abusive to one another. Oh, absolutely. Um, in allegiance to the pa- <laughs> allegiance to the pastor. Um, they kind of back that up. But, but if one of these things have happened like once in your life from a pastor or a church leader, it it can fall under the category of we're all sinners. Mm -hmm. We don't always treat each other with the love that God wants us to. We're humans, of course. And so, um, but but it's when things like this happen over and over and over again. Yeah, again, again it's that systematic pattern. It's the yeah. um, constant um, re- repetitive behavior that you'll yeah. hear. And if you've been in a church system for a long time, like we were 30 plus years, you've heard these things over and over again. So again, we're not just cherry picking little snippets of what someone might say or do. And I think that was a great point to bring up. Because we're, also, we're also not referring to, you know, because you didn't get a solo in the choir or, you know, you weren't chosen to. I think that's important to point out that, um, as I was mentioning a bit ago, the downplaying that some leaders will use about Mm -hmm. spiritual abuse. They say that kind of stuff. They'll say things like, you know, you just got your feelings hurt or you're just coming against the church because you left the church or things of that nature. right? Right. And so we're not talking again about getting your feelings hurt or even disagreeing with certain ways things are run or done in a church system. This again is a And we'll point out some of these things, obviously, and you'll see that um, it's not just about getting your feelings hurt. Yeah. So probably our first and biggest maybe way that um, uh, if you are in a spiritually abusive system slash church, it kind of comes out, it will come out as gaslighting. Mm -hmm. Um, And just to kind of summarize a Webster's uh, definition of gaslighting, because I always can sometimes forget these big words that you learn, you know. Um, It's psychological manipulation of a person, usually over, you know, a large amount of time. Extended period. Yeah. And um, it causes the victim to question the reality or the validity of their own thoughts and their own 
um, memories and the things that actually did happen to them. And then it confuses, it, it lends to confusion right? and, um, a loss of confidence and self-esteem. And then you could even lose your emotional mental stability feels like you are at least. Yeah. And, and I you- think, I think it can, you know, um, really deny the truth of your reality, Yes. Um, which can cause you to even lose sight of what's wrong, right or wrong in these yeah, situations. Yeah, when they're saying to you, like, are you sure that's really what he said to you? Uh-huh. Are you sure that's right? Re- I don't, I think you probably took it the wrong way. You need to go back and maybe pray and kind <laughs> of figure out if that's really. And so what happens in your mind is, oh, I, I might be wrong about that. Maybe I, I did deserve to be yelled at about not having that PowerPoint ready in time. Or... You know, or even an, um, like a more serious example would be um, victim blaming. Like, yes. did you cause this? We were both um, experienced this um, yes. in different situations. And we have to be careful with how much we share about stories um, just to protect people. And um, not that we're protecting the abusers by any means, but no. um, we don't advocate that at all but we want to be we want to be careful about what we're saying because we're publicly known on on you know our names and all of that so we want to be careful about what we're saying about people to not hurt people further um does that make sense yeah and destroy reputations because maybe some of the other people that were involved that treated us wrong might be living a different life now and have repented so we don't really want to dredge that up but right I think the examples are important at the same time. So it's kind of a hard. Right. So back to what I was saying is we both experienced being blamed. For being abused. Right. And that it could be our fault. Like we caused it to happen. Correct. Yeah. And that's not okay. That's not okay. Especially if it involves um, any other kind of abuse. Really, yeah, physical you know, abuse or things that are illegal, like yeah. stalking or things like that. So, um, yeah. So another example of gaslighting is they can pretend conversations never happened, mm. and they can just act like that. I never told you that. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember ever telling you that. You know. Um. They can shift blame or deflect because they don't want to be held responsible. Some church leaders are pretty good at that. Um, Another example of gaslighting is minimizing or ignoring behavior. We kind of already talked about that. Another thing is words, their words and their actions don't match. I've experienced that for sure. Um, I think a good, a good example of gaslighting is when pastors will say, will get up and say, well, if you love God enough, you'll You'll do, you know, one, two, three, or A, B, C. Mm. You'll do these things. And so you just automatically assume that if you don't do those things, or if you don't even agree, or you don't think they're biblical, that you don't, they're telling you that you don't love God. That's gaslighting. Yeah. And um, I think, and we've mentioned it in previous episodes about how these church systems will take things that are just traditions or just what they've twisted the Bible to, um, to interpret, to put heavy burdens on members. And we have an example in the Bible of the Pharisees doing, doing this in uh, Mark seven, one through 23, Uh, It says, now when the Pharisees gathered together to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands defiled, that is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands, observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they purify themselves. And there are many other traditions which they observe the washing of cups and pots and vessels of bronze and the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not live according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with hands defiled? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me in vain. Do they worship me teaching as doctrines, the precepts of man. 
Yes. You leave the commandments of God and hold fast to the traditions of men. So this is one of the ways that they will will gaslight you is using traditions and things that God never established as commandments and they'll hold them over your head and um, spiritually abuse you with them. Yeah. And they make them equal to the the Bible or Mm -hmm. to loving God or whatever. And so then you get a distorted view, you know? Yep. Um, Another, another example. So gaslighting is our first one. Well, gaslighting, I would say is a tactic that is used Okay. In spiritually abusing people. Yeah. Um, now we just want to kind of point out some Actual. of these um, things, red flags, if you will. Um, if you see these in the church system that you're in, um, it could be a sign that you're in a spiritually abusive system. Yes. Um, our first one is distorted view of respect. I think they forget the very simple adage that respect is earned Mm -hmm. not granted um abusive leaders demand respect without having earned it by good honest living yeah and again we talked about this in more detail um, last episode about god-given authority and where that authority comes from but in the church so often it seems like just if you have the position or the title and so it just comes without any sort of real examination of your lifestyle or your teaching style or the way that you treat others. And so it's really important to understand and catch if there is a distorted view of respect. Another way will be testing you to see if you have complete obedience to what they say or what they tell you to do. That's so wrong. We have an example of um, a very distorted view of respect. Uh, we will be taking you over to the Fighting for the Faith channel um, mm-hmm. of Chris Roseboro. He just put out a video uh, at the rec- time of this podcast recording, at least, um, where he's talking about the prophetess, quotes used for those mm-hmm. listening, um, Catherine Crick. He's been kind of coming up against her. She's a very well-known false prophet in the NAR world. <laughs> um, I'll just yes. come out and say it. And she um, has a church in the uh, Southern California where she is the so-called leader prophet. And in this episode, the people there are honoring her for her birthday, which there's nothing wrong with honoring people for their birthday, but they take sure. it to a very extreme level and they call her mama and they bow down and worship her for her birthday. So let's watch this clip. Apostle Catherine Crick. What on earth? Yeah, let, let just just watch the move here. It just it's it's unbelievable. Closer. They're really far away. I love you, Mama. I bless you. <laughs> um okay. And she's not the only one. Let's Hi Mama <laughs> I just want to honor you, and I just thank Jesus so much for your life. You have such a pure, precious heart, and if it wasn't for your obedience to the call that... Yeah, again, the, the, they, these people are legitimately worshiping mm-hmm. Catherine Crick as if she is the Savior. What on earth? God gave you on your life. I know I wouldn't be here today, and I wouldn't have been set free. And I just, I'm so grateful for you. And I'm just so thankful to be planted here. I've seen my heart molded and just more Christ-like and even him doing things in my family that I'm just so thankful. And 5F is such a blessing. <laughs> thank you. And you are such a blessing as well. So thank you, oh, Mama. Man. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you, Mama. She Happy called birthday. Her. They all call her Mama and they all bow down and make her touch their head. <sighs> So she's sitting on a platform and in a chair and they all one by one come through and tell her how she's basically their God, their mama, and they bless her and bow down to her. So this is a very extreme uh, example of distorted honor and respect, but you might see it in some more subtle ways in your church when the pastor is elevated to this position of right next to Jesus himself in many cases. And I love what Chris does in this episode because he's a pastor himself 
And he points out so beautifully through the scripture that even the apostle Peter at one point, um, someone came to bow down to him, Cornelius. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm a man just like you. You don't bow down to me. And he gives a few other examples. And he just points out so well from scripture that a pastor is a servant role. Yes. And so it should be the opposite way around. Yeah, that'll take us right into our next um, one, which is partiality. Mm -hmm. And this can be hard to spot because, well, particularly when partiality is shown to the pastor or his family or the church leaders, because members are told to honor their leaders Mm -hmm. and to um, show them extra honor and extra respect and but there's no partiality in the body of christ so it's okay to honor people and it's okay to give um, honor to you know those that deserve honor Mm -hmm. but what we're pointing out here is is there a partiality extremism going on here where the pastor and their family get exalted above everybody else you know maybe people that are doing actually more work in some cases yeah And I'm just thinking too, like even some sins can be okay and some sins aren't. Mm -hmm. It's all in the pastor's head, what he thinks is, you know, good and bad. It's, it's. Yeah. And you can even see this sometimes in, you know, a counseling session or in two people um, in the church that are in some sort of issue and one person is the bad guy and the other person is the good guy. And so maybe you're experiencing that, or you know, someone who's experienced that, that should not be the case in God's church where someone is given partiality because they're a leader or because they're a male and not a female. Um, God is really clear about class and division and all those kinds of things in his word. So Amen. that's a, Amen. that's, that's something to be on the, the lookout for is partiality, extreme partiality in the church. Yes. Another one would be demanding servanthood of their father, of uh, their followers, um, instead of, um, being the servant, as I already mentioned. Um, so yeah. in many of these cases in the big, celebrity churches you'll see where the the, where the pastor is living these luxury lives well over anybody in his congregation and um, sometimes you can even see that on a smaller level where the pastor has all this prestige in his life and they're living behind gated um, in gated communities or you know having all the things you know (laughs) boats and rvs and planes and (laughs) and um vacation homes and all these kinds of things that it gives a false sense of, um, well, I'll just use your word prestige, you know? So it makes it feel like, oh, I really need to emulate them and do what they're doing. And it's, and it's distorted as though that's a blessing from God because they're in that position. Yeah. When they're not in, in, in many cases, they're, they're getting this money, um, to have all this off of people that are working hard and in some cases yes. just barely making it from paycheck to paycheck. And because again, twisting God's word and taking the Bible to be used as a weapon, yes, <laughs> they put um, these burdens on people that they have to give their money to them and lots of it. Yeah. It's, it's really. So it, cr- it creates a dependency too. I think when you are seeing someone um, live in a special way, you know, you create this dependence on them thinking that they're the ones that are going to give you all of your spiritual information. And they're the only ones that you can listen to and yeah. learn from. A lot of times you'll hear somebody say, well, I need to check with pastor on that and see if it's okay. Like yeah. I want to do this or I want to do that, but I, Barf. I have to check with pastor on that. That that's not, that's not, it's, it's okay to seek, um, advice from people that have gone through things to um, get wise counsel in hard situations. But if you're, if you're just trying to make a regular life decision and you don't even have the ability to make that decision without going to your pastor, you are in a spiritually abusive system. Yes. And you can leave by the way, (laughs) I might say that a few times throughout. 
So I think that leads us kind of into the more extreme ones where the pastor turns into more of a dictator and he's yes. telling everybody what to do all the time um, in in different cases. And you get in a lot of trouble if you fall out of line mm -hmm. um, or fall out of step with even just his his preferences, you know? Yeah, and this can come down in like really harsh um, language. Yes. Privately or even over the pulpit where they're talking down um, to yeah. you. We've seen it in both cases. Um, and sometimes it's a little more subtle. We have a clip here of... Uh, Rod Parsley, he pastors a mega church in the Columbus area. He's a Pentecostal pa pastor, not a UPC pastor. Um, but uh, here's a little clip of him, and we'll let you uh, determine what you think about this. I had on my baggy jeans, and I saw a hockey puck. I didn't even know what it was. And I grabbed it, and I stuck it in my hip pocket, and I ran outside the store, and there was snow around the corner of where you come out the door. And I dove in that snow, and I buried it, and I started praying God. Right? Come here and tie my shoes, son, please. Uh, right? Come here and tie my shoes, son, please. Uh, I guess he did say please. Come here and tie my shoes, son. And the... His little uh, ball boy mm -hmm. comes running from the front row to tie his shoe. Yeah, he, he sticks can, his foot He can't out. even bend down and tie his own shoe. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is a subtle but I think obvious example of a dictatorial, narcissistic, abusive leader who expects his little altar boy to come and do all his little things like tie his shoe for yeah. him. And is it wrong to assume he only added please because he, he was on camera? He realized it sounded terrible. <laughs> um, we're going to read first Peter five verses one through four, because uh, it gives us clear instructions on how elders are chosen. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Shepherd is very different than dictate. Mm -hmm. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Yeah, such a good passage there about how um, Peter saying, you're not to be domineering. You're not to be excessive and dictatorial over people. You're supposed right. to be an example of what a servant should be. And... I, so it, it goes to show you that domineering pastors aren't a new problem. Right. But I think it's more and more evident in the Western culture of today, in Western church. Um, and I think, as we mentioned earlier, in some of these cases, this bullying goes on for many, many years, um, sometimes unrecognized and sometimes recognized. Um, we yeah. listened to a podcast uh, a year or so ago a very popular podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Yes, about Mark Driscoll, Pastor yeah. Mark Driscoll. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just downright, just to put it down in simple terms, he was a bully. Yeah, and... And a, a dictating pastor, that's what, that's or a domineering pastor, that's what they are. They're bullies. Yep. And, and that has no in, place in God's church no. as a leader. We learned that in elementary school. You don't bully. Yep. Highly recommend that uh, podcast, by the way, if you haven't listened to it. Um, yes. You can see what's going on in some of these churches, and um, it goes on for years. And he was uh, almost ousted from his church and then uh, said the Lord told him it was time to move on before it became a bigger <laughs> spectacle, and now he's down in Arizona doing it again. I just I think it raises some questions on how does this go on for so long before it gets exposed and yeah. um, what kind of virtues are being mistaken for these kind of actions, right? 
Um, I'll link below an article from the Gospel Coalition that kind of talks about this if you want to read a little bit more about why this is happening. Um, he goes on in this uh, article from the Gospel Co- I can't even say that <laughs> from the Gospel Coalition where he um, points out a lot of these church leaders are getting their examples from CEOs or generals mm. and why you can get good things from that. You can also get a lot of bad things from that. And yeah. so um, I think it's important to point out that domineering goes against against all New Testament teaching on the way that church should be, if that's not obvious. And examples of, of elders uh-huh. and pastors in the, Absolutely. In the New Testament. Yeah. Um, Christians across the board will have differing um, views Always. on how church governing should be structured and all that. I think that we, as we pointed out loud, <laughs> as we pointed out last week, um, scripture is very clear about one thing. And that is that churches are, are to be led by plural leadership. Yes. And so I think in many of these cases, again, it's when you have this one, this one man that is making all the decisions. And even if there is a board or there is a quote unquote elder um, board, are they being held accountable by that elder board? Is that elder board actually functioning in the church as it should be? Or are they just yes men um, just placating to the, to the man? Yeah. And I think pastors can even say, oh, well, I've got a group of men that lead with me. Well, they're all very clearly under him as he is the top of the pyramid. They are under him. So they're still going to be um, submitting to his authority in everything, Mm -hmm. even the small things. Yes. And in many cases, these men have become leaders because they are yes men. They are doing the bidding for the pastor. And when they get up, um, they say things like a clip will play in a little bit um, where they give the pastor all the allegiance. They give the pastor all the glory. And um, anytime that they are up in the pulpit, they're going to make it very clear who the leader is. So it's not a plurality of leaders. And um, these men are never tasked with making any sort of counseling decisions with people or anything like that either. It's like, again, what would the pastor, we got to go see what pastor would do. We got to ask pastor what he would say. Yeah. Yeah. I think first Timothy lays out really well what the qualifications of a leader is. Yes. And so you can find that there in for, uh, first Timothy chapter three. Yes. Um, we're going to play a clip from the life challenge church. Um, this is not the pastor speaking, but a guest speaker. Um, he's going to make very clear that he can't make any decision, um, without the pastor's authority. Yes. Oh, thank you, Jesus. How many of you are excited to be in the house of God? (laughs) Praise God. I love my pastor and my pastor's wife, our first lady, the family. Uh, Pastor, thank you for all the sacrifice. Family, it's greatly appreciated. The whole family, that's been a sacrifice for the family. This didn't happen by coincidence and by chance. There was a lot of work. Again, I'm going to pause it here. Again, there's nothing wrong with giving honor at times to people, but this is what we see when we watch people get up in the pastor's pulpit. They have this idea that they have to spend five minutes worshiping the pastor for everything he's done and giving them the authority to preach God's word. Yes. It, it's a really distorted. That was put in to what has happened and it has all blessed my life and my family. This is home. Until God tells me otherwise, which comes from my man of God, this is home. I'm going nowhere. I mean, no, no, um, no reference to what God did for his life. Let's talk about that first. Yeah. Again. (laughs) Or what Jesus did for us. Salvation comes from the word of God and the mouthpiece is just the servant, but I think we've elevated the mouthpiece as the words he used to be the most important part of the, he can't even make his own decisions about moving. Yeah. You know? And that, that the, that God's, God's telling him is going to come from 
the his, pastor because mm-hmm. the pastor is God's mouthpiece. Yeah. We're not, we're not living in the old Testament with a prophet having to tell you what to do. If you can't make a decision about that kind of thing, again, you can seek advice if you want, but ultimately it should be your uh, decision. Amen. So let's go through a few more of these. Guilt tripping is another one we have. Yes. This is, um, this can happen when they make you feel bad about something that you (laughs) sometimes stupidly decided to confess. I mean, Mm -hmm. I can't think of how many times like I regretted ever having a conversation with my leader um, because I felt terrible after I got out of that meeting, sadly. Yeah. I can remember a specific conversation I had during a very dark and hard trial in my life. And I was confiding in the pastor to help me Mm -hmm. through that situation and turning to him in my limited knowledge of what he should be able to help me with in this so-called session, you know? And I remember getting off of the phone, I think it was, and just going, this didn't help me at all. I feel much more terrible than I did before I got on the call. And I'm never doing this again. I'm never pouring myself out because again, it was blame shifting, all sorts of um, guilt tripping and, it didn't make me feel like God was my answer and that I had hope. I had the same type of situation where I had um, a very scary thing happening in my life, quite probably illegal. And I confided in him for help, hoping he would um, address the other person in the situation. And Because they were in the church and in... Yeah. And he, of course, the pastor is the boss, you know, of everybody. So I was begging him to deal with this other person that was, yeah, was, have, was treating me so wrongly. Um, and I was, I was blamed. I was told it was my fault and he gave me the reasons why it was my fault. And it was kind of just, my sin was thrown back in my face and Mm -hmm. there was no mercy. There was no grace. It was, it was traumatic for me and it has stayed with me. And I mean, along with guilt tripping, they'll guilt trip you about tithing. Mm -hmm. They'll guilt trip you about your attendance, your involvement, your involvement. Yep. Yep. Lots of guilt tripping. Don't bury your talent, things like that. So the word of God can convict you, but you shouldn't be guilt tripped by a man. That's a sign that you're in an abusive situation. Another sad and scary one is public shaming. This happens a lot over the pulpit. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we're seeing this uh, and we have seen it for many years, but it's just so blatant now. I just, I don't know how I didn't see it before, but this, this public shaming of people is. Yeah. Particularly the poor sound man. <laughs> yeah. He <laughs> gets get the, the, he gets the brunt of the deal because <laughs> you can't make everybody happy, right? It's too loud, too, yeah. too soft. Yeah. This is calling names and behaviors out over the pulpit. Um, Mm -hmm. using hateful tones and anger, treating people unjustly because they aren't obeying your (laughs) teachings, Mm -hmm. things that you've decided the Bible says, and it doesn't. Um, Church leaders have no right to expose or publicly shame or downplay you in front of everybody much less, I mean, I've watched this happen in, in leaders meetings type yeah. things, you know, very, very small groups of people, um, but definitely have, have seen it happen tons of times over the, uh, in the congregation. First uh, Thessalonians 5 and 11 says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Of course, he's talking to the church there, but. Yeah, I think it would be a rare case where you needed to publicly address something. Um, Super it, it rare. It would be blatant, rebellious, outright um, uh, sin that is really obviously hurting the body of Christ. Yes. And, of course, you'd already went through all the processes of going to that person and bringing another person to that in a private setting. And it, it would have to get to a process of that. We understand that. We're not talking about that kind of rare situation. We're talking yeah. about um, just the the open shaming that happens all the time. And you see it also with 
these stories that they tell about people that didn't follow what they said to do and then this happened to their life or that happened to their life. And so even years after they're not even part of the church, they're still publicly shamed yes. in front of people. We heard that over and over about people, their names wouldn't be used in many cases. Um, but there were people in the building that knew who they were talking about. And it just, that is not what a godly leader should be doing is getting up and publicly shaming someone. And I just think, how would you like that done to you? You mm -hmm. know, a lot of times I think about that. James 2 and 13 says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Yeah. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I mean, that's what, that's the side we always should lean on. Yeah, that's the side that Christ leans on. It is. And um, as believers, we should, we should emulate well. that. And yeah. so... If you're in a system where you're you're hearing that or you're seeing that, um, that should be a huge red flag. The next one is secrecy, and we experienced this um, in the assembly we were part of, and I think it's a uh, a big one in spiritually abusive systems. Secrecy when you see people um, in these religious, we'll call them systems, um, being secretive. I think it's a big red flag to watch out. Yes. People don't hide what is appropriate. They hide what is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can, it usually results, secrecy is usually results um, because of being image conscious or like performance based. We grew up in a very, very performance based system. The UPC has very. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that one next. Lots of extra things. Yeah. And um, another example would be turn the tape off. Yeah. They're going to talk about something they don't want recorded or documented. Yes. We actually have a clip of that. We want to play right now from a uh, church, Pine Grove Church. This, I think, is a UPC church or an apostolic church. Um, One is Pentecostal for sure. This is yeah. the Summit 2020. Uh, yeah, this happened just, uh, just in December of 2023. And this is towards the end of the service where the speaker... The special speaker is going to say, I want the tape cut because I want to talk about something I don't want people online, I guess, to hear. This is Cody Marks and just a trigger warning. There's oh yeah, Thank heavy you for that. yelling and heavy microphone breathing. Yeah. Gross. You you I'm not gonna apologize and we may we may do it before it's over. <laughs> I have to pause it already. I'm not gonna apologize. That's that's, that's great to hear from a leader. Hey, Listen, I'd love to dance. I'd love to shout. I'd love to bounce off of these walls. But I'd be fine if that happened on Sunday night because somebody here on Friday night, come on, lay their ear on the altar. Come on, and you go home with a teachable spirit. You go home. This is browbeating people. This is a form of spiritual abuse in... Definitely. But here we go. He's making a cut cutthroat cut I want to cut off the live stream cut me off and there's and they do it and they do immediately <laughs> and yeah, he's so going to proceed to say something that obviously shouldn't be said because yep again why do you need to say something in secret and we experienced this in our own assembly where the pastor a few times back when it was tape would say stop the tape or even when it became digital turn off the recorders um, and then proceeded to talk about um, someone that had left the fellowship and how we were to not follow them anymore, listen to them. There was someone that had been in our assembly many, many, many times. And um, yeah, secrecy. It's a, it's a red flag of an abusive system. You want to yes. say anything more about that? Nope, I'm good. Okay. Um, another one is performance preoccupation. When church leaders are preoccupied by the performance of their church members. Mm -hmm. So in abusive spiritual systems, power is postured and authority is legislated. So it's, it's taken care of if you don't <laughs> abide. Yeah. We kind of touched on this obedience and submission thing a little bit last week um, on our last episode. Uh, yeah. It's, it's really pounded into you that the obedience to uh, the word of God is obedience to the one man and it to is. the leadership of the church. 
And it's distorted sub, uh, view of submission. Yeah. I mean, from top to bottom. They, they, they do not accurately and correctly divide that word. Biblically. They don't. And I think if obedience and submission are words that you hear really often in your church, that should be a sign that these, uh, the system that you're in could be spiritually abusive or yes. probably is because, again, these things should be uh, modeled Amen. and they aren't something that should be demanded. Yes. Biblical authority, again, comes from the word of God and you don't have to demand that. No, you don't. And you're probably under a narcissistic leader. Yeah, I, I would likely. say you are. And again, statistics show that you're in the yeah. very, very small minority if you're in a church with a pastor that isn't narcissistic. Right. Uh, I would say consider the words of Peter and the other apostles, like in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, it says, we must obey God rather than man. Yes. You'll notice here that Peter is saying this to the religious leaders that he was disobeying. Mm-hmm. Out of context, obedience to leaders looks like good theology. Yes, it does. Add the larger context and you will see that it is only appropriate to obey and to submit to leadership when their authority is from God and their stance is consistent with his. With his. Right. Not their own, not extra biblical traditions of men that they put on people. And... For lots of reasons, followers sometimes obey and follow orders to avoid being, <laughs> like we talked about, publicly shamed or even shamed in private. Mm-hmm. I've been shamed in private and it is so devastating. You'll do anything to avoid that. And yeah. you follow orders to gain someone's approval or to keep your spiritual status or your church position. I know that in the church we grew up in, you were removed from your position or from the platform, particularly if you were doing things that the pastor didn't approve of. And these were not even things that were (laughs) biblical sin. No. And, and it created a culture where you were, you know, spying on people, you were tattling, uh, gossip is a big thing in a spiritually abusive, narcissistic, uh, setting, uh, church, unfortunately, yeah. Um, so if you see those kinds of signs, it is a, it is a big red flag. Yeah. Uh, we should touch a little bit on another one called that we see is the lack of balance. Um, and I think this shows itself in many forms. It can just be the lack of balance between your church involvement, yeah. um, and your home life and the things that you are doing for the church versus the things that you're doing with your with your own life and your family. And in these high control, spiritually abusive churches, I would say it's just pounded into you how important that everything you do revolve around the church system. Yeah. And then that should be your first, first allegiance. That should be what you're spending the majority of your, of your free time doing. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I think there has to be a balance. If you're going to church every night of the week and you have no family time, that is not a balance. And God doesn't look favorably on that because somehow, some way this is a revival or this is God doing his end time work. We set everything else aside Yeah, uh, during these times. We set everything up. The Bible says all things done in moderation. Yeah. And sometimes these, these situations are praised and exalted like as, well, back in my day, you know, we went 13 (laughs) weeks without, you know, a night off and we would give the women, uh, you know, one night off a week to wash their hair, you know, or go grocery shop. Yeah. It's just. (laughs) so weird. There's a lot of extremism too. Mm -hmm. And not only their belief system, I mean, their belief system is, is quite extreme, at least the, 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 uh, denomination that we grew up in. But, um, you see it, even the, the, you got this one camp really heavy on the spirit side and they, they, they need the fresh word and fresh anointing and really extreme on the, the spirit. Yeah. The fire falling every week. And yeah. And then they contrast that again with what you would say is like the real traditional, you know, no spirit church where it's just very rigid and you follow up 
order and you know you yeah. just read from a text and and they they kind of make fun of those churches too mm-hmm. sometimes you know which is not nice but anyway that could be a sign of spiritual abuse for sure if you have a lack yeah of i think that one you know we could really dive deeper in just like all of these but try to think about that when it comes to a situation in if you're in one of these churches um think about that you know is there a balance here or is mm-hmm. something out of out of alignment um another one is unspoken rules and sometimes you don't find out these rules actually until, until you you've already them. broken them <laughs> <laughs> which um and that's scary you know you don't want to break rules you learn that even just as a kid but oh it just goes yeah back to i think i think that some of these unspoken rules are these traditions in the church and because they're not spelled out in the Bible in black and white, they're not maybe talked about again until you're in the church longer. And then it's like, Oh, but well, by the way, here's this rule and here's that some, rule. Yeah. And they try to act like these things aren't and rules. they may not. Yeah. They may not even be explicitly told to you, but they are very much exampled and you may even be pulled in private and told them, you know, behind the scenes, Hey, look, we don't, we don't say that to the pastor. We don't, we don't, um, ever talk about that in a group setting, you know, these things and, and you learn them along the way and you're like, Oh, uh, oops, sorry. And then, but they're not, they're not grounded in anything, definitely anything biblical. Right. Um, I know one, like it's better to be nice than to be honest. And so we, instead of confronting things in a biblical and diplomatic and godly kind way, we would just, it's better to just. Well, yeah. And because they're the pastor or because they're the leader. Yeah. We aren't going to come against them because they're in that position. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.25, therefore, having put away falsehood or lies, Mm -hmm. let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So biblically, we are instructed by God's word to be honest and not lie and go and in a humble way of course it's not that we're trying to point out people's of course not yeah but we're we're supposed to speak truth and stand up for what's right yeah absolutely so yeah if you um have ever experienced some unspoken roles you should know that you are probably in a spiritually abusive system yeah and i think there's i think there's more that we could we could talk about of course um yeah Lots more like isolation from friends and family, mm-hmm. isolation from some in some severe circumstances, like from your spouse. You know, yeah. they'll, they'll say like, your wife has a Jezebelic spirit. You need to either deal with that or you need to start separating yourself from that. Or they'll say, you know, your yeah. husband isn't as spiritual as you and yeah. he's not he's clearly not leading your family spiritually. So you need to do that. And I mean... Yeah, and I think there's a lot of grooming that goes on to yeah. um, make the pastor be the spiritual leader in the family in some cases, in these smaller, yeah. more extreme cases. And so I would say there's a lot of other examples that we could use. Oh, yes. And we'd love to hear from you. You can. There's ways that you can leave a comment. And so tell us uh, how you've experienced this or something Along those lines. Yeah, yeah. But just to, I mean, we kind of want to flip the script, right? And leave off on a good note, which is um, just to kind of talk a little bit about what healthy leadership should look like. And I kind of wanted to point out that the woman caught in adultery, um, I think it's John chapter eight. Um, there there was a difference in the way the religious leaders looked at her mm-hmm. and the way that Jesus looked at her and he's the one we should be emulating not the religious leaders yeah and as we already mentioned before healthy leadership should follow the example that's clearly spelled out in god's word like first timothy three first peter five church leadership is supposed to honor god yeah yeah (laughs) right 
and should be held by people who make us feel safe yes. and comfortable under their leadership. Yeah, church leaders should point us to Christ's freedom through forgiveness and repentance and grace, not make fun of people who think they're being abused. You know, right. I've heard pastors say, oh, you think you're being abused. That's that's a click word these days or something like that. Clickbait, you know? clickbait word it's, or whatever they say, yeah. Yeah, that's so wrong to say to people. And you don't have to stay in these kinds of churches. No. And if it's if it's something that's clearly a violation of the law, um, confront it and have a witness with you. Um, and if it's something that you need to call the authorities on, then you should, you should report it. Absolutely. Um, it shouldn't be hidden. Yeah. And definitely as you're coming out, and this isn't just about spiritual abuse, but just being in these church systems can bring up a lot of hard things and trying to deal with it. Definitely seek help. And I mean, there's Christian counselors out there and there's, there's communities out there for sure. And there's resources uh, yeah. um, that yeah. you can find online. We'll, of course, link some of things below as well. I just want to kind of summarize again because we've talked about a lot of things. I just want to summarize again what spiritual abuse is if you've made yeah. it this far. So, again, spiritual abuse is a form of emotional and psychological abuse. It's characterized by a systematic pattern of coercive and controlling behavior in a religious context. Right. Spiritual abuse can have a deeply damaging impact on those who have experienced it. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, people fall away from their faith if they've been in an abusive system. Yeah. And so um, let's just summarize. Um, this again is not an extensive list, but these are just some of the spiritual abuse things that could be happening and should be a red flag if you're in a system or a church where there's manipulation and exploitation enforced accountability, censorship of decision-making, mm -hmm. requirements for secrecy and silence, coercion to conform, inability to ask questions, yes. control through the use of sacred texts or teachings, requirement of obedience to the abuser, the suggestion that the abuser has a divine position, isolation as a means of punishment, superiority, and elitism. Yes. And if any of these things are going on, if you are a part of a church, these are red flags. They are a waving. <laughs> yeah. And um, they're like a sign going, get out, get, get out. out, get out, um, and save yourself some heartache. Yeah. Mental anguish. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I give advice to people. I should say it this way. The advice I would give to people <laughs> if they asked um, on if they're still in one of these systems and they're waking up to it is get out, just get out. And there isn't any advantage of staying longer. My, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't get out quicker. Absolutely. And so that would be a, a, a piece of advice I would give people. I know that it seems like it's going to be a really, really hard transition. And sometimes it is, but I can tell you that was a good decision. Yeah. Yeah. And don't be um, scared by the things that they say to you, like you're going to get sick and you're going to get cancer and you're going to get in a car wreck and you're going to get flat tires. And I mean, well, that, that stuff, stuff could happen. Like, I mean, that's, that stuff happens to everybody because we're, I mean, we're living in a world yeah. that is fallen. And so yeah. don't let those abusive tactics keep you trapped longer than you need to to be trapped is what I should say. And yes. so I would say just some of the things that you can do to help if you've been in a, in an abusive, um, spiritually abusive system is again, recognizing the signs of spiritual abuse is so important. Mm -hmm. And again, there's resources. We're just scratching the surface here really. And just wanting to throw it out there in case it's helpful to someone. Um, again, like you said, seek professional help. There are people out there that, um, have studied this, that are good Christian counselors, um, and find a safe community of people that you can be open with that won't judge you for what you've been through. Yes. 
Um, and I think then another thing would just be to take care of yourself in a transition period, whatever that looks like for some it's exercise for some it's, um, spending time in God's word or not for a period of time, just to, to decompress from being spiritually abused. Yeah. Just some self care. Yeah. Sure. Uh, set boundaries. I think yes. that's really, really important to set boundaries. Like, I'm not going to allow this in my life anymore. I'm not going to allow someone to degrade me. I'm not going to be part of a secretive system. I'm not going to be a part of elitism or right. um, spiritually manipulative systems. Yes. And I think one of the most important things is we need to forgive. We really need to forgive those that have wronged us because Christ has forgiven us of all the sin that we committed. And that's how we find forgiveness in him is by forgiving the, the Lord's prayer says, forgive us as our debts we, mm-hmm. as we forgive those ha- that have indebted us. Yes. And so that doesn't mean that we have to forget. I think it's important to remember it is. and that helps us draw those clear boundaries when we do um, have a healthy remembrance of what we've went through. Yeah. And if you do have a pastor, I would just, um, encourage you to pray for them, Mm -hmm. especially the ones that are the biblical pastors out there. I mean, just pray that they remain in a, in a spirit of servanthood and, um, you know, because hurt people hurt people. And so if someone, if a pastor is abusive, um, they clearly have obviously been treated pretty poorly themselves. And so, we want to pray for those people that they would come to realization of that. And yeah. And ultimately we want to see these people repent and yeah. um, step down from that leadership position. Yeah. They should not be in and find the grace of God through it all. Um, because we, you know, we have experienced that and we wish that for the people yes. that have wronged us and the people that have abused us both um, spiritually and in other ways that they would find true repentance and yeah. the forgiveness that Christ um, has to offer. And so there's true freedom in that. There is, there really is. There is. So we hope that um, this has been helpful to someone. Yes. And we really hope that this sheds some light. If you aren't aware of it, or if there, if you know someone, maybe you've been out, yes. but you know someone and, you can share this with them. Yeah, um, absolutely. But make sure you let us know what you think. And if you've been part of an abusive system or something that we may have missed, we love to hear from yeah. the listeners. Um, yeah. And thanks for coming back each week. If you do, or if you're new, welcome. Yes. And if you made it all the way to the end, you're yeah. a trooper. <laughs> Cause uh, sometimes like these on. go long, but yes, we hear from people each week and we really appreciate you reaching out. Yeah. And so sometimes we don't get to comment right away. We're, we're busy like everyone else, but just know if we haven't gotten to you that, uh, we do plan to, and yeah. it's in our, it's in our heart and mind. We're reaching out to you, but we do pray yes. for you. And, um, we want you to know that our hearts are with you and, and we're along this journey with you. Yeah. you know? We're in our, we're, we're in our own place of the journey as well. Yeah. Everybody's so. in a different place and we don't expect everybody to be on the same page. That's one of the wonderful things about following Christ Amen. and being a believer. So Amen. we hope you have a great week and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. God bless.